Good morning, everybody. My name is John Milner, um, partner with Business Advisory Partner for Baker Tilly in Mexico, and it's a pleasure to welcome everybody here. Uh, we have a, a joint event with our sister firm in the United States, uh, Cherry Baker. Uh, both Cherry Baker and ourselves, uh, Baker Tilly in Mexico, we both work in our different fields in um, in tax, uh, accounting, audit, uh, business consulting, advisory services. And uh, it's a pleasure for us to be able to um, share with you today our event, which is uh, is nearshoring the solution for supply chain resiliency. We've got a number of experts um, who are joining us today. Um, and um, over the next hour, we're going to be talking about supply chain, um, how it affects, um, how the disruption in the supply chains in the United States, in Mexico, and throughout the world have affected the uh, production, distribution, transportation industries, and uh, and some help in terms of how that we can deal with this uh, disruption <clears throat> in the business. And um, so, I'd like to introduce. Uh, we've got Joe Henner um, from um, Cherry Baker, Elia Lamaya here in uh, Baker Tilly, Mexico, and Steve Orsillo, also from Cherry Baker who will be um, joining us on, um, in the event. Uh, Joe, Joe Hainer, is, um, he's an assur Director of Assurance Services uh, in the firm, uh, and uh, he's got a, a BA in Accounting, Taxes and Auditing uh, from Germany, plus an MBA from the University of Michigan. Um, Joe is an expert on supply chains, um, an expert on uh, de designing and implementing strategy for manufacturing and distribution facilities. He's also an expert, an expert in uh, specialty transportation, automotive, marine, and supply chain solution verticals in general. Uh, Eliel Amaya is a partner here in uh, Mexico. Um, Eliel is a partner in uh, Global Trade. Um, services so he's got a lot of expertise on the free trade agreement on working with the us and other countries in terms of import export tariffs impact of the new us mexico canadian um, trade agreement um, eliel has got a degree in mexico and trade commerce and customs from the universidad iberoamericana he's also a masters in Global Business from the University of Thunderbird and the Tech de Monterrey. So, um, and finally, um, uh, Steve Orsillo. Uh, Steve is a partner in Risk and Accounting Advisory Services um, uh, with, with Cherry Baker. Um, he's got a Bachelor in Science and Business Administration from Bright University and a Master of Computer Information Science from BU, Boston University. Um, Steve specializes in risk management, internal control over financial reporting, information system security, privacy, cyber, fraud prevention and detection, security and privacy governance, IT assurance services, and SOC supply chain design and implementation. So it's certainly a pleasure to be able to share this um, distinguished group of people today. Um, and. Um, just to let you know, we've got um, a chat um, available. So if any of the participants have any uh, questions along the way, we will uh, we will try and manage the questions as much as possible, either during the event or at the end. So please um, please post the questions on the chat. So without further ado, um, we'll move ahead with the agenda for for today. I think it's something that we've all read about and heard about that the, um, the if we can move on to the agenda, um, I think we've all heard and read about the um, the disruption in the supply chains, which have affected anybody who's been buying an automobile in recent time. Um, also been a big disruption there. Uh, also it's affected the, um, uh, cell phone business, um, anything from electric toothbrushes, um, many of the things of our modern day life, we need to have um, uh, chips and semiconductors. So because of COVID and because of the disruption, and um, also because of the 
ongoing disagreement between the U.S. and China has also been an issue which has not helped. So one of the concepts that we're going to hear about today and we're going to talk about quite a bit is nearshoring. I'm not going to get into too much detail at this point, but it's basically refers to where uh, companies bring their manufacturing locations closer to the marketplace. So um, this has happened a lot for companies in the United States who are moving operations from the Far East and bringing them back to Mexico to be closer to the marketplace. So one of the things here which is a positive is the new trade agreement, uh, an update on the prior and after agreement. And so we're going to talk about that, uh, ease and doing business in Mexico, um, the, the common steps for nearshoring. And Steve then will give us um, um, a very good talk on um, uh, basically um, SOC and um, SOC for supply chain and how, how that is going to um, impact and how that can help us in terms of dealing with the um, disruption in the supply chain. SOC refers to the service organization control. It's a standard which um, Steve will explain to us and he's gonna talk about the different frameworks, whether it's ISO 27001, 31000, whether they refer to risk management or basically the whole IT security framework. So we look forward to that. So moving ahead, um, Dana, Joe, uh, I'm gonna hand over to Joe here and Joe is gonna take over from here. Thanks, Sean, appreciate the introduction and uh, as always, a pleasure to be here and uh, talk about such an important topic as supply chain. So what I, what I did with the next couple of slides, I just wanted to point out um, the, you know, what's going on in, in the supply chain world, what can you read in the press, and just highlight a couple of uh, quotes, which I found uh, interesting. So on, on this slide, we heard about this from John a little bit, tariffs. So just going uh, pre-COVID, um, there was already some dynamic in the supply chain, supply chain changes, um, a lot of that driven by just cost considerations, um, and that was driven uh, from a U.S. perspective very much with the, the tariffs putting in place with China, China being the, the workbench of the world in, in, in many instances, even if it's uh, production not necessarily for the Chinese market, just using um, the competitive advantages China could uh, um, provide, and some of these were diminished by uh, the tariffs, so um, just want to Kind of put that back on the uh, on the agenda if we look at this holistically. If we move on to the next slide, here um, you can already see that you know it's it, it doesn't matter what uh, press you look in and what uh, what you prefer to read. It's it's basically all over the place. Um, supply chain vulner vulnerability which also will be a, a topic um, Steve is going to touch on, how can this be addressed, cyber risks, uh, one of the, the keywords, and uh, maybe even used to, uh, the ad addressing of that issue can ma maybe even be used as a competitive advantage. I'm going to learn more from Steve about that um, later. Um, current developments in the US, um, I'm just saying infrastructure bill, $550 billion bill, um, which is uh, going through the legislation right now. And um, there is a broader understanding, as you can see in this quote from Brian Dees, that uh, something needs to be done with the infrastructure, which uh, segues into supply chain. This is just a, a different way to um, basically formulate it, but it's, it's not only an, an agenda item for the private industry, it's also an agenda item for, for the governments. Moving on to next slide. And that's something John touched on in the introduction, semiconductor shortages, so Bosch, the, the world's globalist uh, supplier. If you go back one um, slide, please. Thank you. So Bosch, the, the largest automotive supplier in the world, they say is basically the supply chain for um, semiconductors is broken. It's, it's basically, um, you know, it doesn't work anymore. Now we can have a long conversation and don't wanna 
take over all the time about you know what the driver really was was it um is that caused by covid um there are many um many people thinking that you know there were kind of issues in place already and covid basically accelerated um just the deterioration of certain supply chain um situations in uh and the semiconductor is um one of that one of these topics which is kind of top of mind and uh, i know john is gonna touch on that at the later point a little bit more with uh, some good data moving on to the next slide so in a, in a summary uh covid19 or um that outbreak the pandemic basically tested the supply chains to the brink and broke many of them um and it's still broken in in many areas uh, globally so the the question now is okay how do i address the current situation and then um also what can i do to prevent um or protecting my supply chain in in the future and the operational topics which can be addressed we're going to touch on that nearshoring being one of the solutions you can contemplate um and then also um kind of broader assessments like um, the SOC or ISO opportunities um, Steve is going to touch on um, in the, uh, towards the end which can be like a you know competitive advantage or create some return on investment um, if you see it in the grand scheme of things um, next slide please so nearshoring uh, Nearshoring uh, was in the press, has been addressed. It's not really a, a new uh, invention, but it, it seems to be a, an, an opportunity for organizations to really revisit their supply chain and um, talk about, okay, what can I do to protect myself uh, in the future? And then one of the possibilities is nearshoring, which means basically relocating operational capabilities or creating operational capabilities closer geographically closer to to your customers to basically take out risk um, out of the take risk out of the supply chain from basically in the example you have your customer base in the us right now you have production in in china so you basically have a um a lot of touch points and um yeah points where the supply chain can be of a problem of shipping widgets from China to uh, to the US or even in, in, a, in a different country um, and then to the US finally to the final destination. Um, not think about, okay, how about um, building up production or moving production from China to, uh, for example, Mexico, which we have seen a lot of our clients doing and contemplating because Mexico has um, a lot of advantages being a being a US based um, or serving US customers. For example, um, you have an increased increased options for shipping means of shipping. So you can, you know, you use basically everything on uh, which is available. You can use a rail, you can road, you can you know truck it, uh, depending on where it is in Mexico. You can use sea, you can use air if it's not too costly. So it, you, you, the variety. You can pick from is, is way higher and uh, gives you flexibility in uh, using different means of transportation. Um, you can also expedite shipping easily uh, because you basically don't have to uh, ship it through uh, from China to to the United States. You can you know basically um, reduce the the risk of um, any setbacks or uh, delays in kind of sourcing out of Mexico, and and for and further you can react quicker so um if you have your your widgets on the on the vessel in the middle of the ocean there's not much you can do to change that um the route of that ship um however if you have uh closer production closer proximity you have uh, really uh, flexibility to make adjustments based on customer demands um john is talking about this a little bit later about um, the changes we see for certain plans driven by semi semiconductor shortages um what are the challenges? There is no real quick fix. So the uh, unfortunately, 
uh, new showing was changes to the supply chain is a strategic uh, conversation. Uh, it's something where you have to look ahead and you have to see, okay, what's your customer base, where you want to be, where do you want to be active in two, three years down the road? And then you basically build this new strategic model and uh, near shoring would be one of the pieces to your global supply chain puzzle, basically. So uh, unfortunately, no, no uh, quick fix, but um, a good opportunity for long-term long -term growth and uh, protecting your supply chain in the future. Another challenge is certainly the cost uh, relocation of um, existing production facilities from China to Mexico um, is going to be costly mm. and it's, it's going to be an investment uh, to be to be made. And uh, another challenge is certainly the supplier base. So if you have like an, an uh, sophisticated supply, supplier base in China kind of helping you uh, producing your product in your factory, you better you, you basically have to build that up or find out what uh, the location in uh, in Mexico can offer you so that you are not running into any local supply base uh, challenges. Moving to the next John. slide. John? John. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just quickly, you mentioned there about um, China and the US. I think it's important to note back in 1990, the US used to have 37% of the share of the semiconductor production. Now it's gone down to 12%. So. Um, what's happening is that you mentioned about the, um, the new infrastructure bill. I think the US Senate has already approved um, $52 billion in funding for the semiconductor industry in the US. Um, also, they've, uh, they're in the process of um, approving tax credits for investments into the industry. So I think you'll see that the US is being proactive in trying to help its own to bring back um, some of this production back into the United States, no? And ju just a couple of other statistics, which are interesting. Um, some of the very large, uh, one of the important things to mention is that the electric hybrid cars need a lot more chips. So, um, so this is like a big demand because now the focus, uh, like in the month of July in the United Kingdom, 26% uh, of the cars built were either electric or hybrid. So, and there's going to be a much bigger you say, focus on that industry, which is going to be a big demand on the, um, on the, uh, on the chips and on the supply chains. But just in the, in the UK alone, in the month of July, production was down for um, manufacturers of automobile vehicles were down 37% year on year. So there's a big interruption. Um, one of the large Japanese companies is likely to cut global production in September by 40% from its previous plan. This is due to the whole disruption in the supply chain. And this is also affecting um, uh, US um, manufacturers. And you've got one of the very large um, pickup trucks, which is shutting down its production for one week in, uh, to catch up on production. Also, there's an effect on um, uh, cell phones and anything that we use in the modern world in terms of um, our day-to-day -day life is got uh, chips. So, so it's not just the automotive sector. Thanks, John. Thanks. Uh, let's let's go back one more slide, uh, please. Great, thanks. So we we touched on that uh, briefly. So for for near showing, why are we talking about Mexico? So Mexico is is no new idea. Mexico is a proven um, so-called extended workbench for for U.S. Um, companies. It's it's uh, there's you know developed infrastructure. It's there's the good talent. It's um, we have the USMCA in place. Elia, let's talk about this a little bit more and the advantages out of that. Um, Aquiladora is a well-known structure, so it gives a lot of um, it gives gives a lot of security if someone wants to decide um, kind of moving into uh, into into Mexico. Uh, one of the biggest advantages um, is the, even with the USMCA, the new USMCA is still very competitive labor rates. And um, the challenges, like everywhere, acquiring, retaining um, talent is certainly a, a challenge. And then um, yeah, crime rates can be 
challenging. However, it really depends on, on location. And it's not necessarily um, very different from any other location in, in, in the United States, for example. So with that, uh, handing it over to uh, Eliel, who's going to take us through the next couple of slides. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, John. Uh, well, I guess one key item to discuss is what happened with the USMCA, what happened with NAFTA. Actually, it was an upgrade from the treaty, a uh, long, steady treaty that benefited all the parties. So I guess it is very important just to give the audience some sense on the changes that happened. There are many, many details that may be uh, are worth to have another webinar specifically for that. But uh, in a nutshell, what we have is that uh, mainly automotive industry was uh, reshaped because of the change of the rule of origin. Uh, at some point, uh, negotiators decided that they needed to split the vehicle into core parts, and those parts had to be uh, also uh, constructed by using iron from the region. And that will threaten what is the supply for iron or steel. And in combination with that, also the labor force wages were, were throwing as a formula to also qualify for a USMCA origin. And what happened with a goods qualifies as, as an ori originary from USMCA? Well, duties go away. So most of those goods are duty free and that will enhance the economy of the, of the three nations that are part of the USMCA. But apart from that, this uh, specific uh, upgrade to the USMCA also focus on digital business also focus on protecting intellectual property and patents that help some specific industries such as chemical, pharmaceutical, and, uh, and many others that are new trends of, uh, of, of, of industrialization in the, in the new era. So uh, apart from those uh, you know, changes and challenges that were faced because of the Trump administration at the moment of negotiation and the way that, that, that was treated, uh, I would say that the change for the USMCA was needed to cover all the digital business that we'll be facing. So, um, in a, as I mentioned, just as a brief summary, here are a couple of uh, industries that were touched by these changes. The one maybe more uh, with more propaganda was the automotive industry, but at the end, I believe that that actually helped uh, the business. Uh, thank you, Dana. Please go to, this, to, to the following slide. So in a way uh, of focusing why choosing Mexico to do to, to business with, uh, with maybe nearshoring or beginning a new business in Mexico, well, we have to take a look at what was issued by the World Bank Organization. Uh, Mexico was ranked as number 11 of the ease of doing business. That means that you can set up an entity in a relatively easy way, set up a bank account, uh, have importations and exportations from Mexico with almost no big challenge. It, it also depends on the industry, but I would say that if you can see this map, Mexico holds uh, 33 states and most of them, which are green, uh, darker green and, and green, are uh, very easy to, to, to set up a business in Mexico. Uh, most of the automotive industry is located in the central part of Mexico. So if we focus on the automotive industry, then again, uh, most of those states are very, very pleased to have an investment that is focused on automotive industry. Uh, next slide, please. So I also included a couple of slides to, to make some key requirements. And uh, I would say that in comparison with other countries, you can set up a, a branch entity within a week uh, maybe you want to set an entity, a full entity, a uh, permanent establishment, uh, an, uh, an LLC, which would be a uh, resemble from, from US. You have uh, three weeks to, to consider. And the cost of set of an entity is not that expensive. It, we, we, we talk about uh, maybe three to five thousand dollars. And that depends on whether you need to have uh, other type of requirements, such as an imported register, or maybe you are dealing with pharmaceutical products, you need to have some specific licenses. Uh, next slide, please. But also, it's worth to comment that in Mexico, copper rate is 30%, and a general DAT rate is 
but you are able to claim back any surplus of VAT on a monthly basis. Uh, we have also taken into consideration the social security cost that ranges between 25 to 30 percent. But at, but on top of that, there is no exchange control. Uh, you don't have necessarily a statutory tax audit uh, requirement that is uh, that is optional. And uh, most of the entities comply with uh, U.S. GAPs, and that is also very very alike to Mexican GAP. So it is uh, sort of easy to move into Mexico, uh, whether you choose to use a maquila that maybe you will explain that a little bit further, or just setting up an entity to have your import and exports uh, coming from Mexico. And I guess uh, that's it from my end. Uh, back to you, Joe. Thanks, Ilya. So, from a from an overall picture, we talked about nearshoring. We talked about, um, from my perspective, doing nothing is probably not an option. And then, what's dual sourcing? Can dual sourcing be an alternative? So, dual sourcing also not really no no uh, new concept. However, um, it, it's it's going to be discussed. We had some some client uh, conversations about, hey, should we uh, keep our existing um, supply chain and maybe add on um, basically a security net or hedge our um, exposure by not only maintaining, for example, the production in, uh, in in China and building up a production in parallel production in uh, in, in in Mexico or have, having uh, inter interchangeable um, possibilities to produce uh, the same same widgets and, and serve the, the overall the client base in uh, the customer base in uh, in the United States. So. So what um, are the advantages out of that? Um, suddenly you have you have created a, a hedge uh, for your for your risk. You basically um, kind of hopefully can offset your your um, supply chain risk. Uh, for example, in Asia, with um, activities in Mexico and vice versa. Um, however, it increases uh, complexity to supply chain because now you have to manage basically two. And to be to be efficient and create return of your on your investment, um, just think about having um, to maintain uh, um, two supply chains. It's going to be it's going to be uh, costly, and then overall, it's uh, it's it's difficult and uh, going to be costly in the end to uh, maintain, for example, uh, two supplier bases for your activities in China and in Mexico at the same time. So. Dual sourcing, you really have to run the numbers. Uh, can be an alternative, yes, but uh, mm. probably more costly than uh, than uh, um, a, a near showing play. The next slide, just a, a summary. If you decide you want to, you know, optimize your supply chain and uh, do something. Uh, in a, in a sense of kind of building something up in, in China, for uh, sorry, in, in Mexico, for example, moving it from China, um, we have to think about, you know, um, basic options. You can do a, a tall manufacturing, you can do a, a contract or OEM manufacturing, you can do, you can set up a full-fledged um, operation and activity in, in Mexico. So there, are, so there are kind of options in between. So you, you basically have some, Flexibility within uh, your decision, making a change, um, given that Mexico already has a very good um, and sophisticated uh, supply chain and uh, manufacturing, industrial manufacturing base. So, there will be a, um, a strategic assessment needed uh, how you want to go about that uh, nearshoring, and maybe you do it in different stages. Handing it over to John, who's going to give us some actual trends and statistics. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, I think um, I think John and Eliel both mentioned um, nearshoring is maybe a new term, but it's been around. So sometimes I think um, we like to make up some new names and call things differently, but to a large extent, this already existed before because. Um, Mexico and the U.S. have always been closely integrated, certainly since the um, LEL, the NAFTA agreement, I think was gone back to the mid-90s, I think was it? 
when the NAFTA agreement in 97, was it? I don't have the exact date, but we're certainly been integrated more closely with the free trade agreement. Um, and obviously this nearshoring term, um, a lot of it is a term which has been used a lot more recently because of COVID and because of the disruption. And, and what it means is that uh, companies uh, want to be closer to their customers. So whereby they have production on the other side of the world and uh, when the supply chains collapsed last year, you had product which got stuck for months and months. Um, so companies now prefer to make investments closer to home. So uh, I think Joe talked about many of the advantages. Uh, if we look at the, there's an estimation, obviously it depends on the type of vehicle, but there's uh, quite a significant reduction. It's approximately, um, the cost of manufacturing a car in Mexico is $4,300 lower than a comparable unit manufactured in the United States. So obviously with, um, with the Far East, uh, with China, there's uh, the issues of, of distance, uh, the cost of managing inventory, um, uh, the shipping costs also, um, there's big saving in shipping costs. So when we look at the production in Mexico, we look at these numbers over 2019, there's approximately, um, the production was over 1 million units um, in Mexico, about 600,000 um, vehicles which were produced in Mexico for the local market and then over 400,000 which was exported. And over 2020, these numbers have come down because of uh, COVID. And uh, I think the expectation is once the supply chain, the chip issue gets resolved, these numbers should should really come back, come back up um, to where they were before. So when we look, uh, moving on, um, um, Dana, to the next slide. When we look at how should we approach this, and I think Steve is going to talk about this as well. Um, one of the good things that we always recommend people to do is to do a current assessment. In other words, where do I stand? What options do I have? We can look at different. Um, I think this slide is more focused on, on the uh, global trade piece, import, export. Um, we have these different um, schemes in Mexico, the maquiladora, shelter, um which um, which are available so a current assessment we recommend uh, this can be done in in two to three weeks and then maybe look at different options in terms of whether we tend to um we can um outsource or bring back some of it because uh, for instance um we have been working closely um into, on a project whereby it was not in the automobile sector, it was in the um, um, consumer products uh, division, and they were looking at bringing back over 80,000 SKUs. So there was a huge um, supply chain of thousands of vendors. So it's not easy to be able to come along and change that. It, it needs a big transition plan, which can take many, many months. So, so this can be, it can be done partially. Some of the manufacturing can be brought back. We can use third party vendors here in Mexico. So, and obviously one needs to look at all the different implications in terms of taxes, import tariffs, uh, requirements under the free trade agreement in terms of uh, labor laws, union laws, which have been changed. And obviously the whole business of uh, compliance. So um, these are things that we need to consider and have to be taken into account. But the most important thing we would say to people is, is do a, an assessment, um, sort of a, a checkup of where we are and let's look at the different options. I don't know, Joe, would you like to maybe add a, um, a few comments before we yeah, end up with Steve? Absolutely, thank you. And, um... We can probably go full circle and see how um, Steve's um, service offering and the uh, the sort of supply chain, you know, in how that fits into these uh, general stages and what state that would, you know, kind of be a part of. But I, I would fully agree. I, I think um, 
count state assessment certainly, you know, you got to understand where you are. You got to possi possibility possi possi you have to have the possibility to basically benchmark against um, your competitors and see how they do it um, and, and see industry trends. And then uh, bringing down your option, it's also coming down to, you know, how much do you want to spend? What's your, um, you know, how much can you spend um, for making a change? And, and where do you see yourself going um, in the future? Um, coming back to my uh, initial comments that this is uh, more of a strategic assessment to kind of anticipate where you want to play, what, what geographic um, space you want to play with what products. Um, in, in the future. And, and then it's really coming down to execution and, um, and then again, to uh, excited to have uh, Steve here on the panel um, talking about, um, you know, potential third party compliance opportunities with uh, SOC reporting and kind of getting an attestation almost um, on your supply chain, which then also can, can be used as a something to present to a potential uh, customer. So um, that that um, process is going to be this process is proven and it's going to it's going to it's going to work well. And it over to Steve. Thank you very much and uh, appreciate uh, the lead in for some of those other slides and you can kind of see here how things will kind of come together. So the goal of the next few slides is really just to talk really about the landscape, uh, the risk landscape, inherently why we are where we are and how to best navigate that and maybe some solutions that um, you all can act upon in order to best prepare yourself um, in emerging into the supply chain cycle here and mitigate the risks the best uh, that you know how. Um, so ultimately, there's no question that businesses are uh, once again, inherently tied together through the ways in which that they operate with its customers, whether it's suppliers, business partners, um, the way that technology has evolved, the use of cloud services, the way of the interoperability in, the, uh, in how we execute has brought kind of this inherent profile where there's this linking and dependency on our uh, third parties, right? Hence the supply chain process. Um, so with that, there becomes a tremendous amount of trust and expectation that third parties are doing what they need to do and the risk of that um, having an adverse impact on their operations is extremely uh, substantial. So uh, naturally, uh, couple that with some of the high profile attacks that have taken place last year and this year. Uh, some examples of that are the solar winds attack. Um, here in the US, we had the Colonial Pipeline that was attacked. Um, there's been some other software uh, providers out there, uh, Memcast. There was a hardware uh, ledger that was for, for digital currency wallets storage um, that was attacked. Uh, Kaseya was another managed IT service provider software app that was attacked. So you kind of get the, the idea that uh, as we suffer with what I would call breach fatigue, every time you you know, open up the paper or turn on the news, you're hearing about another major high profile attack on some level of a supply chain organization that has an impact to, you know, thousands of others underneath. This has gained the attention obviously across the globe in addition to, um, you know, obviously different, uh, different countries here in the US, we have a new executive order that was put forth and, and a big part of that order had to do with supply chain risk management and making sure that uh, inherently, all the software and other technologies that we use through that process are protected. So naturally, uh, this is something that as you step into this process or continue to mature this process, risk management and how you deal with uh, risk management is going to be embedded throughout that cycle. Um, typically, any breakdown in any of your major supply chain uh, parties um, could inherently affect what we would call your service level commitments or your principal uh, service objectives, therefore rendering uh, any type of commerce or any type of uh, interaction potentially um, at putting it at a halt or, or really disrupting it. Uh, some some of the types of attacks out there that you probably uh, have heard about are ransomware attacks, where you know adversaries uh, typ typically some organized crime that has um, put together campaigns to target different organizations of higher profile. 
Um, there's really nobody immune to that, but if you're involved in that supply chain process, you're probably going to be a, a larger target. Um, but ransomware attacks are, are really um, uh, malware uh, gets into the system and encrypts the data um, and they hold it hostage uh, and really a ransom is, is proposed for purposes of, of payment and digital currency. Um, and in many cases, these attacks have evolved. Not only do they encrypt the data and hold it hostage, but they also, if you don't pay, um, they, they threaten to release the data uh, on the public domain, right? So it's almost a double extortion there. So that can have an impact, no doubt, that if one of your major suppliers is, is unable to operate uh, or they can't recover from such an attack, um, that could be very disruptive. There's other types of attacks that we're seeing, uh, business email compromise, uh, where you know uh, a particular organization's email uh, or communication systems gets hacked and uh, messages are communicated on behalf of the organization fictitiously to really steer illicit payments or illicit transactions, wire transfers, whatever they are, um, where you actually have these, um, these fraudulent uh, account takeovers that are happening as a result of that. Uh, attackers are resorting to you know, typical network and web application hacking to break into systems uh, with all of the remote computing that we're doing here because of COVID and, and globally how there's been uh, kind of a shift for many organizations in the maturity of their ways in which uh, people get access to systems has driven attackers to look at different ways of getting in through their VPNs or their virtual connections or their remote connections or attacking them on their home system. So that's had a, a, a big impact uh, obviously to that footprint. Uh, other types of malware that's being planted on IoT devices, the internet of things or um, things designed in order to help um, you know, process and uh, deal with the manufacturing of equipment, things like that. Those, those types of attacks are certainly uh, out in the forefront of also um, taking place. And of course, all the spear phishing that you typically see um, with adversaries trying to be able to get a foothold in. So really, you know, all of this is is something that is raising the bar and third parties are becoming more and more um, uh, cognizant and aware of what they need to do in order to manage that risk. They can't just kind of stick their heads in the sand. So typically that's driving for trust and transparency. So as we step into the next slide here, you know, there's obviously, um, you can go ahead and change those slides to the next slide, please. Um, there's a need for some type of uh, uniformity and way in which we can communicate and gain that trust with third parties. Um, one of the ways that we uh, obviously have had uh, success in doing that historically and, and on the pipeline here is through what's called the system organization control reports. And you may have heard of SOC 1, SOC 2, and SOC 3 in the past. Um, these were typically geared traditionally on um, service providers that were in, in part of the supply chain for, for many of their customers. And it was a way in which an organization can display uh, a system description that makes up, you know, all of the key elements of what they would want to disclose to their customers. In addition, they're having a, um, uh, an, an attestation performed on the controls uh, that are really designed in order to um, prescribe to a particular type of criteria and mitigate the risk of that criteria not being achieved. Um, so you, SOC 1s were typically for financial reporting, SOC 2s and 3s were operations and compliance driven, typically around security, availability, privacy, uh, processing integrity, and confidentiality. You know, those are really the, the major components. But new on the cycle, what's come up in the last few years has really been uh, the element of SOC for cyber and SOC for supply chain. And these kind of broaden the spectrum. So you don't have to be a service provider now in order to get these types of reports. They can be at an entity level. Uh, so if you're a manufacturing company, if you're if you're critical to the supply chain process or you have third parties that are critical, you can use these reports in order to, one, follow a prescribed criteria that everybody can kind of relate to and be measured up against. That also ties back into your service level commitments and your principal service objectives. And not only are you uh, disclosing and following that particular uh, protocol and description criteria, but you're able to get an attestation on that. So as we step into the next slide here, uh, I'll, I'll kind of come into a deeper dive as to what that may all look like. But um, this is allowing organizations, like I said, to be able to follow a framework 
uh, ultimately with a, a goal of getting an attestation to gain that customer confidence, customer confidence, and as mentioned in the slides earlier, as mentioned in the presentation earlier, can yield to a competitive advantage. Because if a supplier is looking at your organization versus another organization, and you've just demonstrated a certain level of maturity to mitigate these risks, and you've also been tested based on a third party um, attestation, that's going to gain them a significant amount of confidence, uh, more so than somebody who can't demonstrate that, and obviously would give a competitive advantage there. So next slide, please. The users of these reports are typically between customers and business partners. So once again, you know, if there's a customer that's that's using uh, any type of these product offerings and they want to get all of the elements of that transparency, um, they can use that. In addition, business partners out there that you may be dealing with in order to serve customers, there's a need for that. And not only do these reports display what's happening within the organization that you're reporting on, but it also prescribes the controls that are expected both at the customer level and also at the business partner level in order to uh, to facilitate the proper mitigation of the risk throughout the supply chain process. Um, so it can be fairly comprehensive to cover, like I said, not only that one organization, but what they're expecting the other organizations that they operate with in order to um, make sure that those organizations are doing what they need to do to fulfill the contractual requirements that they have. Um, so the next slide. So the system and controls that, that we're looking to uh, bring forth here uh, could be you know, producing and manufacturing, distributing a, uh, a physical product or intangible product. It's not just, say, a technology service provider or some other type of technology provider. Um, you can operate on a particular product line. Uh, obviously, the manufacturing and distribution uh, across any entity can be brought forth into this process. So there's a broad range of services that can be brought down again at a system and or an entity level throughout an operation. Uh, next slide. So this report, a um, little bit about this report, the, the first part of the report is really ge geared on management's description. And that description is gonna follow a prescribed criteria. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the next slide. but. Ultimately, um, that's the narrative where you're going to disclose kind of all the key elements that you would typically see uh, within, the, within the expectation of the report. Then you can have management's assertion on how it's the accuracy of the, uh, the system description in addition to the controls that were designed and the effectiveness of uh, the state of the effectiveness of the controls in order to properly meet those components. Um, and again, in an attestation that's tested at, at an appropriate level, either as a type one at a point in time or a type two, which is a period of time could be six months, could be 12 months. Um, and then you, you have the practitioner's report, which is really where they cast an opinion on the actual, uh, the, 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 um, the overall design effectiveness and accuracy of that description. And then we have the procedures that were performed. So there's a level of verbosity there uh, on key controls and uh, the users of the report can see what controls were brought in, how that impacts them and the overall operating effectiveness of this. So that's really the key components of it. The next slide is gonna get into a little bit of what we talked about for the criteria. So let's step into that slide. Okay, so two major components that we have here are really the description criteria that we would have, and then also the trust service criteria, depending on the nature of what you are trying to accomplish. So basically, if you're looking to um, make sure that your principal service commitments and objectives are geared on security and also availability, then you would bring those components in. But if you're also making representations about the confidentiality of data and or you know processing integrity of a particular system, then that's another couple of components that you can bring into this in addition to obviously privacy on any PII. Um, so those are elements that you'd bring forth. And then when you look at the actual description criteria, the description criteria will bring a, co a couple of different factors to light there. Um, typically, that's going to follow suit so that organizations will know the, the, the types of services that you provide, um, the goods or services. They'll, they'll identify, once again, those principal service objectives so that it's clear as to what you're 
overall what you're reporting on. If there's any material incidents that you've had, so if you've had a significant breach or something that would impact those commitments, that's going to be something that's identified within the report. Any inherent and in, in risk factors, you know, typically that are involved in the business uh, are disclosed so users can understand the types of risks that you're trying to mitigate, any of the, the, the particular components of the system and the boundaries, how far does it extend? Is is everything relevant for what they're using your system for? Is the coverage aligned? And then, of course, the, the right criteria. And when we talk about criteria, this was alluded to earlier in the presentation as well. You know, typically in the US here, we're dealing with SSA E18 and different aspects of that attestation standard. However, internationally, you can dual report. Uh, so you could report in on ISAE 3000 and bring the operational and compliance objectives of the international standard into the mix. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be just SSAE 18 there. So that becomes something that's um, uh, very useful for organizations that are following, you know, obviously IFAC and the international standards. Um, so that's another element. The other side of it too is when you start to look at your security components, um, you know, many organizations interact globally with um, ISO 27001. So your cybersecurity program can be predicated and you can tie the relevant controls back to your ISO 27001 or other to ISO uh, compliance standards that are directly aligned to your principal service commitments and your overall objectives of what you're trying to fulfill. Um, another benefit of, of SOC for supply chain here, are there are several, obviously, right? We have a common criteria that we talked about for assessing the overall uh, system of controls and the effectiveness of those controls. Um, this is, is pretty significant when you're dealing with organizations that have third party risk management groups that are constantly uh, in communication with their customers and their business partners, asking and fielding questions about key controls and uh, the key operating effectiveness of controls. This report can be useful for them to provide that to those third parties uh, and answer a lot of the questions that they need. So it will it, it certainly opens up um, uh, some efficiencies from the back office reporting perspective there. It also provides uh, a compatibility across many different companies. So you can compare and contrast uh, and bring those relevant points forward there. Um, there's scalable communication. Again, the level of depth that you bring in to meet the requirements is going to be predicated based on the level of verbosity that you want to have in the report to meet those obligations. Um, so there's a good way of disclosing that without giving too much information that would jeopardize security in and of itself. And again, we're, we're talking about really raising the bar on trust and transparency with critical third parties to make sure that they have a good comfort level for what we do. So using this process to build a program, design a program, whether you decide to go for an attestation or not, creates a, a really good benchmark for you as we go through. And then again, this is gonna display uh, a certain level of program maturity that many of your competitors may not have. That's gonna help you build those relationships and continue to um, you know, um, solidify more and more business that would be uh, trusted to do business with uh, within that supply chain. Um, and of course, it all ties back down to the overall risk management process. So those are some of the key benefits there. So many times when we go through this, some of the first questions that come up are, Really, where are we and how do we get started? And we kind of talked a little bit about this when John was alluding to a couple of factors on things that could be done, not just from a cyber IT and data management risk, but also other elements of the risk management process within the supply chain. So the next slide here is going to really just talk about you know, how do we get started? Um, so the first thing, of course, is you truly have to understand what your obligations are. So what are your legal, regulatory, and contractual commitments? Having a system to be able to identify and, and navigate that is critical in order to make sure that you're compliant. In addition, this is a dynamic and moving target. Many organizations have standard contracts, but depending on the negotiations of the teams and procurement, that may change. And making sure that that uh, is universally adapted so that you know those legal teams and or risk management teams don't set your operational teams up for things that they didn't expect, you can uniformly have kind of a, a rule of engagement as far as what you're gonna handle. In addition, it allows you to define the appropriate scope and again, the criteria. So do you need to bring in ISO 27001? Do we need to do a report on ISO 3000, uh, ISAE 3000 for compliance expectations? Are there other elements that would be key to our service level commitments that we wanna bring in there? Then we're gonna, once we have kind of what our commitments are, what criteria we should be measuring up against, now we need to identify, prioritize, and execute 
what we need in order to see where we are. So it's typically there's a gap assessment and a risk assessment there. Um, you, you look at all of the particular elements of criteria you need to meet, design and make sure the controls are there to mitigate the risk of that not being fulfilled. And then of course, um, you perform a risk assessment and that's not only your own operations, it's with your third parties as well. So it's now it's their interaction with you. So now you're going up and down the supply chain to make sure that your risks are properly mitigated. So you may ask for these reports or some level of transparency from your third parties that you're dealing with as you go through that. Once that's all identified, you're going to uh, basically identify and, and if we could just go back, there we go. If we just identify, prioritize and execute a rem remediation plan. So now you know what you need in order to fulfill and meet those obligations. You, you would uh, uh, perform all of the levels of expectation there and then you would conduct a remediation assessment. So if you've gone through a remediation process internally or with third parties, you then go back and make sure that the remediation efforts are true and complete and are meeting up to the overall uh, program objectives. And then once you've completed that, you can engage for an attestation, uh, third party attestation, independent report on obviously the um, design accuracy and overall effectiveness of that program. Uh, so that's a little bit about that program and, and um, how it may be relevant in order to get a competitive edge and also help you as you engage through this um, third party risk management and supply chain risk management program. Great. Thank you. That's great, Steve. Um, just a bit, sorry, Joel. Uh, just a quick question, um, Steve. Um, um, for any organization or company that might be looking at this, in terms of time frame, the risk assessment and the gap assessment, how long, you know, what's your estimation that that would take? Uh, it's a great question. So it, it's also a loaded question, and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, typically different organizations have different maturity and, and obviously there's a different element of what their obligations are. Some organizations may have service level commitments or principal commitments that are not as robust as others. So, you know, it is going to vary. It's not hard, fast and true, but I will say that typically, you know, from uh, our experience, when we get involved with an organization through this process, there's typically a you know three to four week time period where we're going through and helping them navigate all of the criteria, the boundaries, the expectations, uh, identifying the key control owners and key process owners that we need in order to fulfill those requirements, uh, figuring out what controls are brought into the mix there. And then there's typically a remediation process. And then once again, depending on the maturity, that could take a couple of months. I've seen it go a couple of months. I've seen organizations take almost a year. So it really depends. But typically, you know, there's a there's a few months there of remediation. And then obviously once that's complete, then there's a process there where we check to make sure that the remediation is doing what it needs to do. And overall, the organization, once they've completed that, they've gone through a nice cycle. So they've got a good risk assessment. They've incorporated the risk assessment, not only their own operations, but third parties, their business partners, even some of their critical vendors and customers. Um, They've, they've taken that into uh, consideration. And then basically from there, they make a determination as to whether or not they wanna pursue an attestation so that they could provide that report for that third party assurance to, again, give that trust and transparency, hold to that level of the standard, and also obviously make a, uh, a difference from a competitive perspective. Oh, that's great, Steve, that's uh, extremely helpful. Sorry, Joe, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it shows nicely how uh, you could, you, you could. know, basically um, use an independent, uh, you know, report to, uh, you know, as a as a value proposition or um, as a differentiator in a competitive uh, environment where you can basically um, show, okay, you know, I had that, you know, reviewed and and, and tested, and um, I have also a report basically speaking to my supply chain. So you. If I'm talking to a new customer, this could put them at ease because they might have gotten burned by working with someone else uh, before who didn't have that um, level of assurance. Um, so I, I think it's it's worthwhile uh, investigating if if they make sense. And at the minimum, it's a, it's going to be a good exercise to go through uh, um, that process, that very structured process to identify gaps and identify risk, and then um you know you know what you can uh what you need to address going forward so Joel, very very powerful too. yeah go Sorry. ahead yeah i just wanted to add too that you know there's there's been um 
iterations of this that we've used in diligence processes. So, you know, with our transaction advisory folks helping organizations either on the buy or sell side and or, you know, establishing new relationships with third parties where we've gone in and helped evaluate, you know, uh, both the, the organization and target organizations on, on this type of criteria. So there's a lot of use cases for not only building the program internally, but also, you know, if there's a vested interest in a third party that you're looking to, uh, to get, you know, being able to do that same type of, um, uh, you know, activity in order to get that uh, transparency that you're looking for. Just, just thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, just, just briefly, and I know um, Eliel has all already answered. There was a question on the chat, which I think would be good. To Eliel and Joe just add a bit more color. And uh, the question from Hector Cortez is, how would you suggest the Mexican industrial parks to get prepared to host the relocation of manufacturing facilities as a result of nearshoring? Should they start building speculative, speculative warehouses? And is there a standard size that you would recommend to focus in? Or should they rot away as to build according to the particular necessities of the relocating manufacturers? Do you foresee specific industries looking forward to relocating to Mexico? So maybe if I can, if, mm. if I can start, yeah. and uh, Eliel has also a nice um, up here already. So I, I would um, comment from the start answering the question from the from the end, basically. Okay, starting with the industry. So. Um, looking at you know the data you showed and what we have seen in the past and what's actually going on right now is um, there's certainly a big push uh, in the automotive industry and um, my personal expectation would be that that's going to continue and probably um, expand um, in the future because it's a proven concept and a lot of manufacturers already have facilities so it's it's to expand um, existing facilities then basically starting new ones if you're in a different industry. Uh, however, I always would be, um, now this is the accountant, Johanna, the accountant speaking, uh, would be a little bit prudent uh, regarding, you know, major investments before you really understand the, the, the landscape and what's going down, what's coming down actually it might change. So I would be kind of hesitant doing that. And it's kind of, I guess, along the lines, Elliot's comments are in, in, in the chat, um, but um, kind of, keeping close to the current developments and um, having good understanding of where the industry is going and the industry you're working in and serving is probably the key to make that decision um, early enough so you, you, you're ready and have something in place when it's needed. Okay, John. Eliel, I don't know if you want to add anything. So I guess I'll uh, just add up to, to what Joe is commenting. I, what we have seen is that once the decision is taken, they rather move fast, but uh, normally they don't necessarily uh, have uh, a need in, in, at that precise moment to build something out of, out of the ground. So if you can have some general facilities and that can be increased through time, that will give you a, a step up against your competitors if they only have, let's say, uh, Greenfield to be constructed because that will uh, uh, reduce the time just to 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 make a footprint in Mexico. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Steve, Joe, and Eliel. It's certainly been a, a very very enlightening and interesting um, conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's been able to join us. We ran a few minutes over time, so apologies for that. And um, we do not right now have any uh, specific event on the calendar, but um, we'll certainly be letting you know of any um, upcoming session. Um, we've, I think this has been our third or fourth uh, webinar uh, where we work together, and most of them have been on this type of you know, nearshoring, manufacturing, uh, joint collaborative work and working together. And we work together on many projects uh, with uh, Cherry Bakert and uh, Baker Tilly. Oh.